Hello, everybody. Welcome to the South Reach Linux Kernel Internship Report. My name is Ellen Koike. I am a Linux Kernel developer and also Outreach uh, alumni and also Outreach co-coordinator for the Linux Kernel project together with Vaishali, who is the coordinator. I'm going to start with a quick presentation about the Outreach program. Then we're going to move to the presentations from uh, interns with Brian Osler Jules Inge, Kaira Gupta, Lourdes Pedrajas, and Shriha Patel. Outreach is a remote paid internship to work with free and open source software. Interns get uh, $5,500 stipend plus uh, $500 for tra traveling going to conferences. This year, due to the pandemic, uh, was a bit different, so organized, uh, organizers decided to pay the $500 anyway uh, to help interns. The internship lasts for three months and interns are paired with mentors from, from the false communities. The program is organized by the Software Freedom Conservancy. It was previ previously the outreach program for women, uh, which was organized uh, by GNOME. We have two rounds per year, so one in May and another one in December, and the internship are financed by industry sponsors, sponsors or false organizations. Who is eligible? So women, cis and trans, trans men and gender queer people. US residents and nationals who are black slash Amer um, African American, Hispanic slash Latino, Latina, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Basically, it is anyone who faces systematic bias or discrimination in the technology industry of their country. And interns must be able to work full-time during the internship. So how does it work? Application for uh, The application process for applicants is the following. So applicants must fill out an initial application for eligibility check. Then eligible applicants make contributions and then they submit final application for the project. The application process for the FOSS community is the following. So coordinators sign up uh, their communities in each round. Then mentors submit a uh, project under um, a community. And the community coordinators approve the project. So this is a generic timeline, just to give you an idea. So for the December internship, uh, the initial application deadline was in September 29th. We are now in the contribution period until the end of this month. And um, the internship is going to start on 1st of December until uh, 1st of March. The Linux kernel project has been participating in outreach since round 6 in 2013. Sage Sharp was the first uh, coordinator, then Julia Lawal, then Vaishali with Shadha, and now Vaishali and me. We had a total of 50 interns and about 40 different mentors in a very diverse kind of project from several uh, device drivers, three wide changes, um, and other high impact projects. During the contribution period, we required uh, interns to join the outreach Linux kernel mailing list to go through the first patch tutorial, do some cleanup in staging drivers uh, to learn about patch structure, coding style, and tools. Then move um, to specific project tasks, start communicating with mentors, and start doing uh, the proposed uh, to-do list from, from the mentors. Then they record all the contributions on the Outreach's website and submit the final application. From the past uh, two rounds, so just to give you an idea, in December uh, 2019, we have we had nine candidates with uh, five slots with projects from Spinlocks, DRM, Sparse 2, and PS Store. And uh, last round in May this year, we had 11 candidates for four slots uh, from in networking, uh, sound open firmware project, uh, and Linux media. We are now in the contribution period of uh, next round in December this year. We have four uh, internship, four slots open with six mentors um, for changing internal API, scheduler, DRM, multimedia, 
and SPI. How can you help? So companies and individuals can donate funds to support interns. Linux kernel developers can volunteer as mentors and help reviewing patches. And you can also outreach about the program in your professional circle and local communities. Here is uh, contact information. So if you want um, to contact organizer, you can send an email to organizers at outreach.org. Or if you want um, to, talk, to talk to Vaishali or me, feel free to send an email. And you can also join the mailing list uh, to help reviewing patches from applicants, from, for, from candidates. Now let's move uh, to the presentation from the interns. So we have Brian Osler presenting about improve and extend kernel networking self-test running namespaces. We have Julius Eidenge with fixed lock related warnings reported by Sparse for core kernel code. Kaira Gupta, Linux Media and Libby Camera mood string test support with Vink, Lourdes Pedrajas, improve, improve and extend kernel networking self-test running namespaces, and Shriya Patel, add SOF fuzzer support for IMX8 platform. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brianna Auersler, and I am here on the Outreachy Internship panel to discuss my summer kernel internship with mentors David Karate and Stefano Brivio. My internship project was titled Improve and Extend Kernel Networking Self-Test Running in Namespaces. In particular, the internship focused on TDC, the three-letter acronym for a testing suite of the Linux traffic control system. TDC is a unit testing suite implemented in Python. A little more about the internship. The goals of the project were to add TDC to kernel self-test in order to broaden its user adoption promote its addition to kernel testing suites, and catch regressions to traffic control more quickly. To add tests of the Berkeley Packet Filter, or BPF classifier, and to highlight TDC's SCAPI plugin by adding a test making use of its functionality. Lessons learned. I learned technical information, how to use certain tools, and workflow with the community. Technical concepts I learned about were BPF. BPF allows analysis and filtering of network traffic. Filters that work in traffic control should be able to be replicated in BPF. So I was to test and add and delete of a filter. We selected filtering on MAC addresses, which involves writing a user space program to provide a list of whitelisted MACs, which then get pinned in a map to the file system for a BPF program to pick up and check against when it receives an incoming packet. TDC had this pre-existing SCAPI plugin, and I used that to generate packets and pass them through the TC filter. That work is actually still being completed on my end. More about that later. In order to learn about this, I made extensive use of the kernel header files for BPF, read kernel code, man pages, and had lengthy discussions with my mentor to get to the current state. Tools that I worked with during the internship were make, Git, Git Bisect, C, Python, SCAPI, and BPS. The workflow. My work went upstream to the NetDev community. I submitted code to NetNext and the IP Route 2 package. IP Route 2 contained the user space implementation of traffic control, which can be run with the command TC, while kernel slide changes went to NetNext. Current state. TDC has been added to kernel self test in NetNext. Of the goals I've listed here, that's the one that's been completed and achieved. I also did fix a few bugs that arose during regressions throughout the course of the summer, using Git bisect and proposing fixes. My mentor, David, is looking into effects of the addition of TDC to case self-test on kernel rings and, in, or, and into better understanding adoption of TDC in current time. I do hope to get the work filtering MAC addresses out to the community here in the next month. My timeline has been somewhat slower than I had hoped for. Um, however, I do have a working basic case that I am extending to add that MAC filtering to. I will say that uh, actually working with that SCAPI plugin was a lot easier than I thought. So. 
I'm pretty proud of that. Um, moving forward to talk about the experience. I did enjoy the experience of working with Outreachy this summer. I found the Colonel community and the Outreachy community both to be quite helpful and friendly. Um, IP Route 2 and NetDev were both really friendly and welcoming to me as a newcomer. Um, it was really a great experience getting to work with everybody this summer. Um, I also learned a lot quite quickly, and I'm really proud of that accomplishment. Before the start of the internship, namespace, kernel self-test, traffic control, the difference between user space, kernel space, and SCAPI, or packet generation, were all new terms or ideas that I needed to learn about. In the internship application round, I worked a little with a net test in kernel self-test, and that was my first introduction to kernel self-test. So I really did pick up a lot during this time. I'm actually entering my third year of my computer science curriculum right now, and I'm currently taking an operating systems class, so it's interesting to me to see that same information presented in a different format right now. Um, I'm very grateful to the community and to everybody who helped me during this internship, and to everyone who is attending this panel today, thank you for listening to my presentation. Hi, welcome everyone to the Outreach panel. My name is Jules Irenge. I am a PhD student. My mentor was Bokun Feng. My internship was titled uh, Fixed Lock Related Warning, reported by Sparse in the Linux kernel. In this Linux kernel internship, I worked with Sparse, which is a static checker for kernel code developed by kernel engineers. Sparse was originally initiated by Linus Torvald himself. So to run Sparse in the Linux kernel code, we run the command uh, make c is equal to two in your directory. When you run for the first time, you do make c is equal to two. For the second time, uh, when you have changed the file, it is advisable to run make c is equal to one which only compile the file that you have just changed and check if the issue you are working on has been solved. A typical sparse lock related warning in any file look like uh, this. For example, in a subsystem um, for, for this, this example, I took a RCU subsystem, but it can be any subsystem. We can find like a, a warning like context imbalance. So this lock warning only means that there can be a real bug here, or there can be a missing annotation. Uh, programmers can be sloppy sometimes and forget to write annotation for their codes. Or we might be in a situation where we have just hit sparse limit. My internship task was to go through all log related warning in the core Linux kernel and fix the warning one by one accordingly. By fixing the by fixing I mean most of the time um, I add I added uh, missing annotation or uh, adding, but we can add annotation like equals annotation uh, equals uh, only uh, is, 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 is added when um, the specify locked is held on function exit but not on function entry. We can also add must old annotation when the specify lock is held on function entry and on function exit. So held on entry, held on exit. We can finally add a release annotation when the lock is held on function entry, but not on function exit. We can also clear the warning by refactoring the, the code, the code structure, especially when annotation cannot fix the issue. 
this is a typical spa patch of mine, a sample one. It was a cleanup of 30 warning. And someone in the mailing list sent me a note after reviewing saying that um, he was wondering whether this is a tree of mine or how I'm applying uh, this patch to my tree. I, I found it, uh, personally, I found it quite a bit funny because I'm still a, I was a kernel newbie, I'm still a kernel newbie, but he's talking uh, about a kernel newbie having a tree that was funny to me. Um, the returns are, I got working, I got experience, exposure to the Linux kernel, got experience working with, in the Linux kernel community, I interacted with people in the mailing, mailing list, um, I improved my understanding of the Linux kernel and also found a new passion. I'm currently doing PhD with verification of BPF uh, subsystem. Um, I find it quite interesting. My youth, my huge thanks go to the outreach community and sponsors for making this opportunity available. Thanks to my mentor Bokun Frank for his guidance, patience, sup support, and encouragement. I would like to thank the Linux kernel community. I had a great experience in the mailing list. Thank you for listening to me. Hello, my name is Kaira Gupta and I am a junior at IIT Roorkee, India. I am doing my engineering from there and I was a summer outreach intern with Lip Camera and Linux kernel. My mentor was Kieran Bingham. Let us first discuss what is WIMC? So, the Virtual Media Controller Driver, or WIMC, is used to emulate complex video hardware for testing purposes. It uses the Media API and Vivo l 2 API for emulating the hardware. It has a hard-coded topology which looks like this in the WIMC core, which can be changed and the driver recompiled to suit the user's need. Let us have a look at the major problem we intended to solve during the internship. So Lip Camera, which is an open source camera stack, gives support for multiple streams and it has a pipeline handler for WIMC, which can be used to perform tests on Lip Camera. But WIMC does not support multiple streams. Hence, Lip Camera's multiple streaming ability could not be tested on WIMC. So let's see what I did. The solution was divided into two parts. First, the multiple stream support in WIMC, and second, the multiple stream support in the pipeline handler uh, of WIMC in Lip Camera. So I first implemented multiple stream support in the pipeline handler of WIMC in Lip Camera using a path set by Niklas, which allows multiple captures to attach with a single sensor. So the scalar in WIMC by default uh, triples the dimensions. This can be changed using the controls, but the default is three times. So in case of ambiguous user inputs such as uh, raw given 30 by 30 and RGB given 50 by 50, we prioritize the raw configurations and adjusted RGB accordingly. Then uh, Nicolas pad set couldn't be used to allow WIMC to multiple stream as the pet set created as many threads as the number of streams requested. While uh, in the case of multiple streams, we need the frame to follow just one path, i.e. just one thread. So we decided this design for the streamer and implemented it. Uh, whenever an enabling signal is sent to the start S stream of the streamer, it starts the stream. It uh, starts the individual stream and then it checks if a thread is present or not. If it is, then it unlocks the mutex and if it isn't, it initializes the, pipe, the pipeline and then it starts the thread, i.e. the thread is started just one and the pipeline is initialized just one. Similarly, if 
uh, a signal for disabling is sent to a stream. It stops the individual stream. Then it checks if all the streams have been stopped using the KRF. If no, then it unlocks the mutex. And if yes, it terminates the pipeline and it stops the thread. So let's discuss uh, the current status of this work. The PATSAT is still under consideration on the mailing list. And the WIT pipeline, which is a common object for all the streams, is a common array of all the entities in the graph. I have implemented it currently uh, like this, and it needs improvements. What it currently was, um, first let's see what happens if I bit first search the graph starting from the RGB capture node. It uh, gives the sensor in the middle. Well, if I start the searching from raw capture, sensor comes at one end while the captures come at the other end. Uh, this wet pipeline array is very important uh, because it is what tells the thread the order in which uh, the streams should be passed. Hence, it needs to be in the correct order, which is which in this case is the second order. So, in my implementation, I check if it is the RGB which tries to initialize the pipeline. If it is, I go to the next entity, which is capture. And then I make it the node and start uh, the searching from raw. And if it is raw, then there is no problem. The search goes as well. So uh, this currently needs certain improvements, certain optimization, which is one of my future goals. Then I would try to get the entire bed set merged. I also have to change the pipeline handle of lip camera as several changes have been introduced uh, in lip camera and pipeline handler ever since. So I'll have to rebase it on the top. Uh, let's discuss some of my other contributions as well. So on the kernel side, earlier WinC did not show the order of expected colors over test image. So a small color switch like blue in place of uh, red or red in place of blue, it's unnoticed at times, which actually happen. So hence, I added a control which shows the expected color order description over the test image. I, on the uh, lip camera side, I added a string parsing for pixel format in cam and qcam arguments. Earlier, we had to give the hex values of the pixel formats in the arguments for cam and qcam and now we just have to give their name. Similarly, uh, I modified the two string helper in the camera for pixel formats, v4l2 pixel formats as well as for embers to give the pixel format names, uh, the four cc values and the amber strings respectively. So this makes it very much easier to understand the log and find the errors. So all in all, it was a very enriching experience and I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Hola, soy Lourdes. Tengo experiencia experiencia como administrador de sistema. Últimamente quería contribuir a Linux Kernel, a pesar de esa nueva programación. Así que entré en el programa Triasi. El programa es amigable y es la oportunidad perfecta para empezar. Comentarios y proyectos que están al alcance de aquí sin experiencia previa en programación. El kernel contiene el conjunto de test, -test bajo el directorio tool test y test, -test. Su cometido es el de hacer unas pequeñas pruebas para ejecutar rutas de código individual dentro del kernel. Estas pruebas pueden ejecutarse tras la compilación, instalación o arranque del kernel. Existen varios test, -test scripts creados con la intención de probar rutas de código de redes. Sin embargo, actualmente no existe una forma estándar de crear tareas comunes, como por ejemplo la configuración del espacio de nombres de redes, túneles, puertas de enrutamiento, entre otros, con lo que la lógica es reimplementada de diferentes formas en más de una prueba, repitiendo el trabajo ya realizado por otros programadores. Además, cuando existe la necesidad de añadir nuevas pruebas, se ocuparse de la creación y configuración desde cero de una prueba de red virtual para después utilizarla durante la prueba es una tarea que consume mucho tiempo. El objetivo de mi práctica era reunir todo el núcleo de funciones cuyo trabajo similar con el fin de crear una base estandarizada modular reusable que se encarga de realizar la creación y configuración de esas redes virtuales que se van a utilizar después en las pruebas. Esto ayudará a crear nuevas pruebas de redes con facilidad y rapidez. 
Por ejemplo, con esa sencilla sintaxis puedes crear y configurar espacios de nombres, sus direcciones, rutas, puentes, túneles, etc. Nuestra idea es reducir el tiempo que podría tomar escribir estas pruebas. Con el que el programador puede concentrarse en la tarea que le importa, que es escribir lo que hace la prueba. Esta base modular se tiene la intención de situarla bajo el directorio Tool Testing Test Net. Sin embargo, este trabajo se ha realizado internamente entre mi equipo y estos pases están todavía pendientes de enviarse. Ha sido una experiencia genial, esclarecedora, alentadora y me ha servido para ver cómo trabaja la comunidad. ¿Cómo es contribuir al cambio? Te sientes parte de una comunidad contribuyendo a código abierto. La mayor parte del código de este proyecto está muy bien escrito, es enriquecedor, aprender de estos algoritmos complejos y cómo resuelven los problemas. Hello everyone, I am Shriya Patel and I am here to present my project called Sound Open Firmware that is um, SOF for my Outreachy Linux Kernel Internship under the mentorship of Daniel Baluta. So here's a little bit information about me. I recently graduated as an IT engineer and I also work as a DevOps engineer uh, at Volters Clover since one year. I have always been more interested in debugging and troubleshooting, so I thought DevOps would be a great field to explore. I also work as a freelancer on Upwork, where I mostly deal with Linux kernel related projects. Uh, and um, as you know, I have also been selected as an outreachy Linux kernel intern this year. I started my journey with Linux kernel in my first year of engineering. Back then, I did not even know how to install a Linux OS. It took me almost three years to be here in front of you all. So yeah, it has been a pretty awesome journey. Now, let's move on to our project. What is SOF? Sound Open Firmware is an open source audio digital signal processing firmware infrastructure and SDK. SOF provides infrastructure real-time control pieces and audio drivers as a community project. Why SOF? What is so special about it? SOF is developed in public and hosted on GitHub platform. And that is the speciality since it is very rare to see open source firmware. It helps developers around the world to customize firmware for the devices they have in their mind. It also improves the security of the system and ability for others to collaborate on it makes it even much better. The main component in operating a DSP are a host and a DSP. Host has the SOF Linux kernel driver which communicates and instructs DSP. On the other side, DSP runs the SOF firmware and performs the processing as per the instructions received from the host. Now, before I move on to the objective or goal of my project, I would like to explain some components which I touched in order to better understand my project. First is fuzzer. Fuzzers or fuzzy testing is done by a software component that generates random inputs and sees behavior of the system. SOF fuzzer is an IPC fuzzer that loads and manufactures IPC to send to DSPs. It acts as a host in our system, which means we use a fuzzer instead of a Linux kernel for now. The, processes, the process for fuzzer goes something like this. It first initializes the host platform, establishes connection with the DSP, reads the topology file, sets up the DSP accordingly, sends the first IPC signals. Uh, next component is QMU DSP emulator. It is used on the other side of, uh, of fuzzer, which means fuzzer will be on site A. Um, and uh, QMU will be, DSP will be on the opposite side, which is side B. It acts as the DSP. QMU emulates the IMX8 DSP. For example, it emulates all the functions of the IMX8, which would include what to do on particular instructions, how to react to some changes, what responses uh, to send back. 
now the next part is messaging unit this is the most critical part of our project messaging unit is used for communication it has two processors one is processor a and other is processor b messaging between these two processors is done with four write only transmit registers and four read only receive registers which are present on both the side of processors also to control uh, these messaging we have two more registers called status and control registers again on both the sides so finally how do we uh, how does all of this fall together i have created a rough diagram to show the workflow here as you can uh, see we have two sides side a and side b fuzzer is on side a which is acting as a host and qmu on uh, which imx8 dsp has been emulated is on side b in between we have shared memory uh, and we have also emulated mu here mu a acts as the processor a which carries the messages from the fuzzer and mu b acts as the processor b which carries the messages from our dsp side so that's the kind of architecture and workflow here what has been my role in all of this we had a working progress implementation for imx8 fuzzer that didn't work because uh, mu was not emulated correctly and since there was no proper communication happening dsp never booted so to fix mu implementation i had to understand the components like fuzzer messaging unit qmu apis or uh, sof firmware all these things are critical to understand to fully um, implement a testable uh, emulation this meant a lot of digging and jumping around the code following function calls getting lost on the way doing it all over again so finally we came up uh, with an implementation that successfully emulated mu and our pipeline was executed successfully now let's have a look at the terminal output of before and after phases for better understanding what changed after fixing the messaging unit in this picture as you can see i have highlighted a message which says dsp boot timeout platform imx8 failed to initialize this means dsp waited for some time to get the message from fuzzer via the messaging unit but it never received it and hence it timed out after digging uh, debugging and uh, digging a lot of code we understood that uh, there were problems with the messaging unit emulation in the next slide uh, you can see the output where it uh, says firmware boot complete which we finally got to see after correcting the mu implementation firmware then also successfully parses the topology file that we provided and that's the happy ending so i would uh, like to conclude my presentation by saying uh, thanks to my mentor daniel beluta i wish i could be his student forever there is a lot to learn from him a lot of thanks to julia leval and jonathan cameron for always supporting me throughout my linux kernel journey even when i knew least about it outreach coordinators and organizers have been amazing and did a fantastic job thank you all Thank you for watching our interns and also thank you for their presentation and all their contributions to our community. Please sponsor Autorichi or become a volunteer. Thank you.